R-I-E-G-E-L-S-V-I-L-L-E, -E, Pennsylvania, which is in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I was uh, th third or fourth on the list to be drafted, and I did not want to get drafted, so I started the rounds of the recruiters and uh, ended up in the Marine Corps. Do you recall the date? Uh, it would have been January uh, 1963. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Um, I had originally signed up for the Air Force, but they couldn't get me a draft deferment until um, I was assigned to an officer training school, uh, until I had a date for that. And I thought I was going to get drafted before, so I went to the Navy recruiter. They wanted me to have my wisdom teeth pulled. I went to the Marine Corps and they said, sign here, kid. So that's... <laughs> so it was really your third choice? <laughs> yeah, well, it was just, the, I think it was where the recruiters were located. <clears throat> Do you recall your first days in service? Vividly, yes. Can it you was... describe that? Yeah, it was uh, St. Patrick's Day, 1963, was my first day of active service. And I've never forgiven St. Patrick since. Um, I took a bus from Easton, Pennsylvania to Quantico, Virginia, to Washington, D.C., then to Quantico, Virginia, and got off the bus. And there was a guy there screaming at me to get in line, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And it went on for uh, 11 weeks after that. That's Marine Corps OCS. Where, where was that located? Quantico, Virginia. So your training was right there? Yes. Uh, what was the training like? Uh, very physical, a lot of running, uh, hiking, push-ups, sit-ups. Uh, and then there were classes on mapping and other things that Marine Corps officers would use. <clears throat> when I finished that, I was commissioned in May of 63 as a uh, second lieutenant, and uh, because I was signed up to be an aviator, I went immediately to Pensacola, Florida. Um, and, and the other guys that were also going to be pilots went to, to Pensacola. Most of the people that were going to be ground officers in the Marine Corps stayed at Quantico and went through six months of what they call the basic school. And um, that was just more of what we had at, uh, at OCS. Now, did you choose to be an aviator yes. or the Marine Corps? No, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I signed up for. <clears throat> do you recall any of your instructors when you were at Quantico? Uh, yeah, some of them are um, indelible. Uh, Sergeant D.T. Jones, and uh, he was a he was a staff sergeant, and um, Sergeant Riojas R I J O A S, who was a Native American, uh, uh, and my platoon commander was Lieutenant Ed McGee, M C G E E. What were they like? Um, Pretty much what you'd expect. If you've seen uh, a full metal jacket or one of those, they, they did a lot of screaming and yelling. Although, I must say, Sergeant Riojas didn't. He just um, had a very quiet presence, spoke pretty softly, but everybody jumped when he, when he did speak. Sergeant Jones was the, was the main drill instructor in charge, and he was a... Uh, a southerner, he was probably five, seven, 140 pounds, dripping wet, and he struck fear in the hearts of all of us. He was, he was amazing. Now, when you went to Pensacola, did you go with other members that were going to be aviators from your class? Yes. Yeah. How many of you went? Uh, I would guess about out of. 24 of us from my, my platoon that graduated, that, that were commissioned, um, 
probably six or seven of us went to uh, Pensacola. Now, Bob, why did you immediately go into OCS training? Was it because of your educational background or tests you had taken or what? Uh, educational background. I had a college degree at that point from Penn State. What was your degree in? Business administration. So nothing to do with the Marine Corps no. fighting? No. <laughs> How long were you at Pensacola? Uh, let's see. I was there for um, about 18 months. And that was for Aviator? Yes. What kinds of things did they t train you there? Uh, well, we start with, started with six weeks of ground school, which uh, consisted of mechanics, uh, aerodynamics, I don't know. The, all sorts of things and then we would start flying and the first aircraft we flew was the T-34 which is uh, about the size of the average plane you'd see at Simsbury Airport small six-cylinder engine 130 horsepower uh, we flew that for a number of hours and then we moved on to the T-28 which was a much bigger plane uh, and about the capabilities of uh, the average World War II fighter. Had 1,495 horsepower and it was, uh, it was, a, um, it was a fun airplane to fly because it was, was very aerobatic. Did you know right from the beginning that you were being trained to be a pilot? Yes. And you knew what aircraft you were eventually going to fly? No. So they teach you on everything? <clears throat> well, what, yes, what they do is um, Everybody goes through T-34s, the first, the first section. Uh, and at the time, the Marine Corps needed helicopter pilots, so they were taking nine out of ten pilots were going straight into the helicopter pipeline. They were taking the best pilot and the best student for jets. And, and that lucky person would leave and go to Meridian, Mississippi for the beginning of jet training. Uh, the rest of us stayed at Pensacola uh, we actually went from Pensacola to Milton, Florida, but it's the same neighborhood. It's only a 30-mile drive or something. And started our, what they called, fixed uh, T-28 training. That put us, that put the Marines in the helicopter pipeline. Now, we were also being trained with Navy pilots. And they would go to New Iberia if they were going to go to multi-engines. They would go to Meridian if they were going to jets or they would stay at, um, with us if they were going to fly helicopters. So even so, all through your training, even when you were flying the T-34 and the T-28, did you know you were going to eventually be in a uh, helicopter? Yeah, once, once I was assigned to the T-28, yes, you I knew. 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 Yeah. And knowing that helicopter pilots were needed in Vietnam, did you know that you'd eventually probably be going to Vietnam? No. Well, this was 1963. I think there were 3,000 advisors in Vietnam. Um, I, had, I had no idea. In fact, at that point, I probably knew it as Indochina. I didn't even know the country of Vietnam. Yeah. After your eight months of training at Pensacola and Milton, did you have a graduation? Oh, I'm sorry, 18 months. Um, uh, yes. They had a uh, formal graduation, and I can probably I can probably get a picture of Anne putting my wings on and, and sh my shaking hands with the commanding officer. It was a nice ceremony. <clears throat> Where did you go from there? From there, I went to uh, New River, North Carolina, which is be the air base right next to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, the big Marine Corps base. The Marine Corps has a huge base on the East Coast, which is Camp Lejeune. They have a huge one on the West Coast, which is Camp Pendleton. And then um, there are air bases. There's a jet base at Cherry Point, North Carolina, and the helicopter base was at New River, North Carolina. So I went to New River and I was assigned to uh, HMM 263. Uh, HMM stands for Marine Medium Helicopter Squadron, and 263 is just its designation. I don't know why it's 
HMM rather than MMH, you'd have to ask the Marine Corps that. How long were you at New River? Well, let's see. I, I arrived there in um, October, I guess, of 64. Uh, and um, the squadron I was assigned to was scheduled for what was then called uh, Pacific Tour, which meant that you were going to go uh, on a cruise in the Pacific for 13 months. Uh, it would have been three months on Okinawa, three months in the Philippines, three months in Vietnam, and I guess a month back and forth on, no, another three months aboard ship. So uh, I was in that squadron for a while, and then they were looking for volunteers to go on a Mediterranean cruise. So I opted for the Mediterranean cruise because that was only five months away from home. Um, and I went in June, June of 64 on the Mediterranean cruise. And that consisted of about half of a squadron and a battalion of Marines. And they went over and cruised. We stopped at Spain. Um, made a brief stop at Greece, went to Italy, just cruised around, did uh, practice operations, landings, and things like that. All right, go, go back to when you first went to New River. Mm -hmm. um, now you said that was October of 64, or would it have been 63? 64. Um, what did you do once you got there? Was there still more training? Oh, there? yeah, yes. So this was now, what were you flying? The same thing, the H-34. Oh, the H-34. Uh, so when did, had you flown a helicopter when you were down in, in Florida? Yes. Um, Navy training consisted of the T-34, the T-28. The T-28 included landing on a carrier, um, which was very exciting. Um, instrument training. And then we started flying helicopters. The first one we flew was the H-13, which is one of the little bubble helicopters. Um, that was great fun. And then we went to the H-34, and we flew that for the rest of our training at Pensacola. And then when I went into the fleet, that was the airplane that I, that I flew. Can you tell <clears throat> me a little bit about the H-34? Uh, it's... Um, it actually has the same engine, I think, as the T-28, so somewhere around 1,490 horsepower. I'm not exactly sure. It was a Wright 1820 engine. That much I do remember. Um, four blades, uh, four main rotor blades, and uh, a tail rotor, which is a counter-rotation device. Um, it could carry eight to 10 combat-loaded Marines, 10 to 12 combat-loaded Vietnamese, because they were smaller. Um, it carried 1,500 pounds of fuel and um, had a range of about 300 miles on a full tank of fuel. It went in service in about 1954 and the year I left Vietnam, they gave them all to the um, Viet South Vietnamese, and they were replaced by the H-46, which is the twin rotor one that is, is still in service. Marine Corps st just now phasing that one out. Did you fly the H-34 the entire time you were in the service? Yes, I did. So you must have become pretty good at it. Uh, well, I guess. <laughs> All right, so Some of my co-pilots might argue with that, but... <laughs> All right, now, on the Mediterranean cruise, um, you were trained as a helicopter... Oh. I just popped this off. Now, when you went on the Mediterranean cruise, um, was this for training purposes? Or yes. Or was there a specific mission? No, it was training purposes, and we were supporting a battalion of Marines that were also aboard the ship. 
the ships. It was a, you know, we, it's standard training. You, you have simulated uh, invasions. We did that in Sardinia. So are you actually stationed on the ship or do you on go the ship. to, so you're always flying your helicopter off the ship when you're on this cruise? Right. Except for a brief period when we went ashore on Malta and spent a week or two uh, living with the British in the British BOQs, Bachelor Officers Quarters. And when you do that, do you bring your helicopters on the land? Yes, yeah, and we flew out of uh, Valletta, which is the capital of, uh, of Malta. So what kind of ships would you be on, like aircraft carriers? Well, in on the med cruise, we were on an LST, which is landing ship tank, I think. Is How the, many helicopters can fit on that? Uh, we had about 10 or 12. They, they put them, only two, only one can fit on the flight deck at a time. But the others are in the, uh, what they call the well deck, which is below the, the flight deck. So we, it was a slow operation off that, off that ship. Now later, I, I was on both a World War II aircraft carrier, the Princeton, and uh, the Iwo Jima when I was in Vietnam. And those were much larger? Much larger, yeah. They were, the, the Princeton had actually been um, a World War II um, aircraft carrier, so it was a full the, the Iwo Jima was, was called an LPH, which is um, Landing Platform Helicopter. And it's, they're designed for helicopter operations as opposed to fixed wing. So your Mediterranean cruise was five months? Yes. So you were gone that entire time and then you returned to uh, North Carolina? That's correct. And how long did you stay there? <laughs> I got back, well, back up a little bit. When I, was in, when I was in Greece, we were standing waiting for a mail plane to come in at some little airfield. Um, and somebody said to me, did you hear what happened to MAG-36? Mag and MAG-36 is Marine Aircraft Group 36, West Coast comp comparable to the group I had started in in North Carolina, six helicopter squadrons and all the ancillary people. The entire group had been moved to Vietnam. And at that point I knew that it was going to be just a matter of time after I got back before I went to Vietnam. Because so this they, was in the summer of 63 or summer of 64? 65. Oh. Summer of 65. They started, that was when the, the big buildup began in September of 65. And um, I was back I got home in November, and by December I had my orders to um, to Vietnam. And I left in at the end of March in '66. So you received your orders in December of '65. Yep. And what did you do between December and March? I was at uh, New River uh, in a squadron, still flying training missions. Well, the new urgency, you knew you were training to be over in country. <laughs> yes. And we were training with some people that had been there, which was helpful. You know, what some, was that like? Uh, the training? Yeah. Uh, fairly routine. You know, you, you've just, what you were trying to do was become more proficient at flying the, air, the airplane. So it was mostly in helicopter, not classroom training. Yes. So you were flying most of the time. Right. We did have some lectures. We had a lecture from a um, man who had been a POW in Korea, and he told us that under the uh, under our orders, we were only to give name, rank, and serial number if we were captured. And he said that is pure baloney. He said you will tell them a lot of stuff. He said what you want to do is have a story ready one that you can stick to and tell them that story every time you get questioned. And that's, you know, I fortunately never had to use it. Did you have a story ready? I don't know. I, th I thought I'd make it up at the time. <laughs>
Did you have any leave before you went over to Vietnam? Yes, I had um, a couple of weeks leave. Um, and Ann and I took our whole savings and went to Vail, Colorado skiing for a week. <laughs> Where did you fly out of to go over to Vietnam? Uh, San Francisco. And, did you go with a squad and, or on your own? I was, I was an individual replacement. Uh, but I did end up with two uh, guys that I had actually been roommates with on the med cruise. We ended up uh, and going at the same time. And we landed in Okinawa, spent a week there, uh, maybe a week, three, three or four days there, processing, getting shots and waiting. And then they bundled us all into a C-97, I think it was, C-119, C-119, and flew us to um, Da Nang. What was your first impression when you landed at Da Nang? It's hot. It was, I had been skiing as I mentioned and uh, it was probably 95 degrees with about 90 percent humidity and um, <clears throat> sunshine that was filtered through this haze so it looked like a like a white hot light and um, when we landed, the, the sergeant that was going to be processing us and assigning us to where we were going to go told us to go get lunch. So we found the mess tent and they were serving liver and onions, which I despise. And I thought, I'm not going to like this place. <laughs> that was literally my first impression. And then we went back and there were, as I mentioned, there were two other guys, Jerry Bowman and, and Jim Van Gorder and I who had been on the med cruise together and we were hoping to stay together. Well, of course, Jerry went to Fubai, which is north up near Wei. Jim stayed at Da Nang and I went to Chulai, which is south, about an hour's flight. <clears throat> so we were completely separate. Was there a separate. marine base at Chulai? Yes. There's a, there's a big jet base at Chulai and abutting it sitting on an ed, a little plot of land out on the, in the Ch South China Sea was Kiha, K-Y-H-A, which was the base that, uh, where I was assigned a squadron. <clears throat> so at Chulai, uh, did they then assign you to a specific helicopter? Helicopter squadron, yeah, I was assigned to HMM 363, the Red Lions, um, and fortunately uh, there were, there was Dave Bunting and uh, Tom Tierney, two guys that I had been legal officers with just before they left for Vietnam. They, they left a month before I did. We had, the, we were the legal officers at, uh, at New River, so I, I knew two guys in the squadron as soon as I got there, which was good always helpful. <clears throat> so once you got to this new base, what were your duties? Fly. Uh, we, I had... Did you immediately start flying? Uh, I think, yes, the next day I think I was flying. Um, they start you with, um, I mean, you're not flying by yourself. You, you, you fly as a co-pilot. And um, <clears throat> the first day, um, the, the operations order came out and I saw that I was flying and I went down to the ready tent and went in and a major was briefing, uh, it was a four plane resupply mission. We were going to fly, pick up groceries at one place and take them to the guys out in the field. And I came to find out this is a very routine mission. But I, I said to the pilot I was flying with, uh, I haven't been issued a weapon yet. I didn't have a, I hadn't picked up my 38 yet, 38 caliber pistol, which we carried. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. And my, the thought that went through my mind is, if he says don't worry about it, why is he decked out like John Wayne? He had a submachine gun and, and a 45 caliber pistol. But I thought, oh well, and away we went. And it was routine. We just 
you pick things up here and take them over there and repeat. It went back and forth. It was probably a three or four hour mission. And uh, you just, <clears throat> the Marines, unlike the Army, um, used the H-34 for a variety of missions. We did medevacs, we did troop insertions, resupplies, um, uh, recon insertions, <clears throat> any, any mission that needed to be done, the 34s did it. They were supported uh, with gunships, which were Hueys. That's what the Marine Corps basically used the Hueys for, uh, for gunships. <clears throat> they did have some slicks that were used for VIPs that didn't want to ride in the old dirty 34s. So. Were most of your missions supply missions at the beginning? No, no. Uh, Was it, could it be a different mission every day? Yes. Yeah, in fact, uh, I think the third and fourth day I was there, I was assigned to night medevac, which is not anything uh, anybody liked to do, because the only time you went out on a night medevac was if um, uh, someone was shot and it was life-threatening. Otherwise, they were to stay with the unit until morning and, you know, when it was safer. But... Um, you recall those first couple night medevac missions? I, I only went on the first one, yes, I recall it. Can um, you describe what that was like from start to finish? Yeah, we, we slept in the ready room, ready tent, um, and they had this klaxon that would go off if they got a phone call, if they, if they had a mission come in, and it was, ah, 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 and it woke you up immediately, and you slept with your boots on, and my job as a co-pilot was to go out and get the plane started and get it ready to go. The pilot was briefed on where it was. We always flew with two planes. We never flew singly. Um, and the, the two co-pilots would go to the, to the planes, get them going. The pilots would get briefed and come out, and then we'd, we'd take off. And the first night, it was quite dark, and we flew to the coordinates where, we, where they'd been told the, uh, the wounded guy was. And it was, they had a, a red flashlight that they said they were gonna shine at us when we were over the zone. We've, we found that and then we started, we pulled into a hover over the flashlight and then started a slow descent down into the landing zone. And uh, the pilot said to me, you watch the radio altimeter, which measures your height from the ground, and tell me where we are. Call out the, the number of feet. And when we got to 10 feet, we were on the ground, and we loaded the guy and took off. And I don't know where we were, um, but it was, it was pretty scary. It was, it was very scary, as a matter of fact. The next night I didn't have to go, and then the next day one of my friends said to me, Bob, these guys are taking advantage of you, the scheduling officers. They gave you medevac twice in a week. He said, we usually only get it once a month. So I went and had a chat with the ops people to let them know that I wasn't going to be scheduled again for a while, and I wasn't. How long did you fly as a co-pilot before you took over as pilot? <sighs> Probably three months, because the flying is different. Um, it, in the States, uh, safety is the watchword. You don't want to do anything to potentially hurt yourself or anybody else. But in Vietnam, you have the added problem of potentially somebody shooting at you, and so your approaches into the zones were much faster and therefore much more dangerous. Um, so we, we had to learn a new way of flying. And you always, you, you would circle down into a zone and you would circle out of a zone straight up until you got to 1,500 feet. That usually took you out of small arms range and then you'd go up to 3,000 feet and continue the flight. You recall any of your other missions while you were co-pilot in those first few months? 
Yeah, I remember the first first time I saw a dead man. Um, I was I was flying co-pilot, but I was in the right seat, which pilot seat is the right seat, co-pilot seat is the left seat in a in a helicopter, which is the opposite of of most airplanes, and that's supposedly due to Igor Sikorsky being left-handed, but I don't know if that's just apocryphal or not. But anyway, I was. I was flying in the right seat, and we went out to pick up a medevac, and they brought him around the front of the airplane. And when he passed my window, he was clutching his stomach. His hands were wrapped over his stomach. And I just knew from the look of him that he was dead. And uh, when, when they got him in the plane and we got back, the crew chief said uh, he wasn't alive. That, uh, and um, the first strike we went on, strike is a troop insertion into a zone where there's expected to be enemy activity. Um, we were formed up in a long single line going into the landing zone. And I looked off to the right and I saw F4s and A4s dropping napalm on the, on the uh, tree lines on either side of the, of the landing zone. And uh, it was a funny comfort, you know, you thought, well, they're going to have to keep their head down while we go in. We didn't take any fire, but uh, again, it was, it was pretty exciting. And the first landing I made, I really screwed it up, and I broke the, uh, the tail wheel on the helicopter. How did you do that? Uh, trying to land too fast. And I, I brought it. You were the pilot at I, that point? Yeah. It was your first landing? Were you landing, were you inserting troops? Yes. We had, we had a full airplane, which makes it more difficult to handle. How full, how many men on a full airplane? Probably 10, uh, 8 to 10 at that point. And what, see, what they try to do is get as many people into the zone as they can as quickly as possible. Because if you drop just a few people in and the enemy is around, they're very vulnerable. So you, they try to get a mass of people in. If you're carrying eight to ten, how many other helicopters are with your group that are also dropping eight to ten? There were probably 18 helicopters in that operation. Where were you in the queue of dropping the men? Probably about eight to ten. We were somewhere in the middle. So what happened? How did you end up breaking the... I just came in for landing and I put the, pulled the nose up too late and it slammed the tail wheel down and, uh, and broke it. It was very embarrassing. You fly back with his tail wheel hanging down. You know, it's... <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't slow the mission up or the next guy no, was no. coming in behind you. No, no, it didn't damage the plane. It, we were able to it take off and able leave. able to fly yeah. fine. Yeah. Was, it, was that your only um, disastrous landing? I think it was the worst, yeah. I th that was easily the worst. Did you take any ribbing from your crew? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Now, once, were you a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant? Uh, at that point, I was a second lieutenant. Shortly afterward, I was promoted. Well, let's see. I, I got my commission in May. It took about 18 months, so whatever that is, I was a first lieutenant. And then what seemed no time at all, they, they made me a captain. And um, that was, you know, was, was very nice, but I knew I wasn't staying in the service, so it didn't really matter that much to me. When you took over as the pilot and not the co-pilot, um, how was that different? Because now you weren't prepping the helicopter, you were in getting the briefings. Yeah. That's the main difference. I mean, um, that plus, uh, initially you start off as the the number two or number four, so you're not in a position of leading the flights. But as you become more experienced, you'd move up and, and start leading the flights. Then you had to worry about the the planes behind you or with you. You know, you had to your your decisions had to include what was going to happen to, to those planes as you go into a landing zone or whatever you do. Did you become familiar with the, the terrain? Because I originally said, you know, your first one, you didn't even know where you were <laughs> to fly. Did you 
as you stayed there, were you always flying the same territory? Generally, uh, we operated from a, a place called Tam Key, which was a few miles, I don't know how many miles north of Chulai, down to Quang Nai, which was about, a, about an hour's flight south. That was our area of operation. Then Da Nang would take over up until you hit the Fubai group, and then they would take on, they had the northern edge of the I Corps. <clears throat> I'm sure you know that Vietnam was divided into four corps, as they called it. They had the I Corps 234, and um, the Marines were operating in, in I Corps only at that point. Did you become familiar enough with the territory that you knew landmarks and you knew exactly where to go when you flew out? Most of the time, yeah, you, be, you become very familiar. Uh, there's only one highway, that was Highway 1. Um, if you got west of Highway 1 very far, it sometimes got tricky. But that's where the, the Papa Smoke uh, name comes from, because when you'd you'd be flying and you'd be, you'd be in ground contact with the troops that you were either resupplying or picking up a medevac or whatever. And you would go, as you were approaching the zone, you would tell them to pop a smoke. These are smoke grenades. They would, they would pop that and then we would identify the color of the smoke. Because initially when they went over, they would say, I'm popping green smoke. And then of course the Vietnamese who were very clever discovered that, or the Viet Cong were very clever, discovered that they could pop a green smoke and maybe lure you down into their area of operation rather than the one you were supposed to be going to. So you always told them to pop the smoke and then we identified the color before you would go into the zone. Oh. Did different color smoke signals uh, mean different things? No, no, it was just random. It was just a, a means of clearly identifying so that you weren't going to... I remember one, one flight we... I don't even know what we were doing, but we said pop a smoke and you know, there were four that came up. And <laughs> it, was, it was the enemy. They were, as I say, they were very inventive, very clever. Did you fly with the same crew the entire no. time? No, it was a constant switching around. So any given day it could be different crew members? Yes. Yes. And we flew with uh, pilot, co-pilot, uh, the crew chief who sat in the door, the big door on the side of the helicopter, and then on the left side there was a, a gunner in the window. We had uh, two M60 machine guns on each side of the, of the plane. Did you finally get issued a weapon? Oh yes. <laughs> I got that the next day. <laughs> now, did you spend your entire time in Vietnam at July? No. Um, got there in April. I think it was July. Uh, our squadron was scheduled to rotate aboard ship. Uh, July they, of 66? Yes. Um, the Marine Corps had a... Um, I guess you'd call it a floating police force, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. They had a squadron of helicopters and several ships with uh, a battalion of Marines that floated on the coast and was, they would be inserted in any hot spots or as, as they were needed. And um, our squadron was scheduled to go aboard ship. So we went aboard the, the Princeton, the USS Princeton. Um, and and did that for three months. And then at the end of that period, the squadron coming aboard, HMM 362, uh, was low on pilots. And, and they were asking for uh, volunteers to stay and five of us volunteered, uh, not immediately. We thought about it and we stayed aboard ship. Um, shipboard life was significantly better than 
in country. They had clean sheets and ice cream and snacks at night and movies and little things. How was the duty aboard the USS Princeton different than when you were at July? Did you have the same regular flights every day? Was it fewer or you were still always flying missions? We were still always flying missions. Um, just from a different base? Just from a different base, yeah. And the first, the first three months when I was aboard the Princeton were, uh, we were right up along the DMZ and um, there was a big operation going on, and we were we were flying all the time. It was uh, it was never ending uh, the flying up there. And and really, when it came time to decide whether to stay on the ship or go back in country, it was not a cut and dried uh, decision. You know, we weighed the options pretty heavily because we had spent a lot of time up there, and it was a it was a nasty operation. There were a lot of a lot of casualties on. The Marines took a lot of casualties in that operation because it was one of the first times I think that they really faced the North Vietnamese Army, which was much more a much more effective fighting force than the Viet Cong. How long would a typical flight be when we fly out on a mission? Anywhere from. 45 minutes to one day, I think I flew eight hours. You'd come back and land and refuel and then go back out again. Uh, yeah, it, it was, those were very, very hectic days. You were, so there was no, not a typical mission. Oh, no, it no. It was a no. com completely different picture every time you went out. Yep. Now, you knew going out whether it was going to be an hour or an eight hour day? No, it, it again, depended. Uh, depended on Went how field. things went, yeah, yeah. If there were a lot of medevacs, it might take longer. Sometimes we would have to take people from our ship to the USS Repose, which was a hospital ship, and, and drop them off. And there were lots of different things. Carrying uh, dead bodies to Da Nang for transshipment to the States, uh, just anything they needed. We were, you think of it as a truck, you know, a pickup truck that just runs, runs errands all over the place. After you'd been at Chulai and you'd gotten used to taking off on land, how was the transition to taking off from a ship deck? Not much different. Um, the ship deck moved a little bit, of course, but it's, helicopter flying off a ship is, is relatively easy. It's. Uh, the only time it isn't is if the seas are very heavy, and uh, we only did that once or twice. Now, you touched on a, uh, living conditions, so let me ask you a little bit about your daily life. When you were overseas, how did you stay in touch with family? Letters. Uh, Was it good mail service? Yeah, the mail service was good. Uh, sometimes if, if, when we were aboard ship, if we were moving around a lot, it took a while for the mail bags to catch up with us, but uh, the mail service was pretty good. Most of us also had little reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders that we would record uh, tapes and send them to our wives or family. Now, you were already married when you went to Vietnam? Yes. Yeah. What was the food like? I know you said that it was better living conditions aboard the ship. What was, what was food and living like at July compared to being on the USS Princeton? Uh, July was, July's food was forgettable, I guess is the best way. I, I basically would finish most meals with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, they had uh, bug juice, which I think was Kool-Aid. We couldn't get milk. Uh, the, the milk they had was powdered milk that was reconstituted. Um, I, the, it was typical food in the field for, uh, for servicemen. I mean, it wasn't Did great. Did you have a mess hall that you went we to? We had a mess tent, yeah. Most things were in tents when I first got there. They had sort of thrown Chulai together. There were 
they were starting to build uh, huts, which were made of wood. But when I first got there, we lived in tents. These so you big, in tents also? big hardback tents. Yeah, there were eight or ten of us in a tent. Um, and then when I got back after. In aboard ship, they had everybody had uh, what they called hooches, these little huts with uh, flaps that came down over the windows for the rainy season. That was it was rustic. Cold water shaves in the morning. Um, a walk of I don't know 400 yards to the to the area where you could take a shower and. Uh, Now the food on the USS Princeton was better. Much better, yeah. They they lived well. Uh, they had most of the food was was very good, and you, at, in the evening you could get they had they opened a snack bar. You could get hamburgers and ice cream, and they had real milk. It was the conditions were much better. What? Where did you sleep when you were on board the, the Princeton? USS? We had we all had. Staterooms, too lavish a phrase, but there were. You had your own room. Uh, no, we had three or four guys to a, two to four people in a room, typically. Did you have sufficient supplies both at Chulai and on the USS Princeton? Did you always have enough ammunition, uh, clothing, weapons? Yes. Or? Yeah, that never seemed to be a problem. Did you feel any pressure or stress? Yes, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> How did you deal with that? Uh, I don't think I did anything special. I just, just sort of dealt with it. You know, I mean, you'd get up in the morning and you knew you were going to be doing something and you did it. Everybody else was in the same boat. Um, I can't say I enjoyed it, but uh, it was. It was just something you lived with. Yeah. Did you do anything special for good luck? I don't think I had any. No, I don't think I had any rituals that I did. I probably did, but I just can't remember. I'm pretty superstitious. I, I became very superstitious after Vietnam. You know, it's a strange thing. What did you do for entertainment when you weren't flying? Uh, they usually had movies, and I read a lot, wrote letters. Um, depending on where we were, we'd go to the O Club, have a drink. Um, although I did very little of that in Vietnam when I was in country. Um, one of the first two weeks I was there, um, they gathered up all the pilots one evening about 8 or 9 o'clock and said that there was a special forces camp that was being overrun and we were going to have to go in and try and get the the Americans and the, and the Vietnamese out. And um, the guy I was scheduled to fly with, and, and I, again, I was green, it was only been there about three weeks. The fellow I was scheduled, scheduled to fly with said to me, you're going to have to do all the flying. I've been at the club since four o'clock and he said, I'm too drunk to fly. So, it, luckily, it wasn't. It was canceled, uh, and we didn't have to go. But at that point, I thought, I don't think I'm going to do a lot of drinking because I don't want to go up. If there had been two of us that were drunk, it would have been a really hairy situation. Did you see any USO shows while you were over there? No, I was never in any place where they where they came through. Did you have any leave while you were overseas? I went to um, Hong Kong uh, very late in my tour. I, I was holding out to go to Australia. I had always wanted to see Australia, and there was a rumor that they were going to open Australia as a uh, R&R &R stop. I, I would, the choices then were uh, Japan, Malaysia, um, Hong Kong, the Philippines, I guess, and and I was waiting. And six months after I got back, they opened Sydney as a <laughs> R and R base. 
So I went to Hong Kong for a week. What was that like? Heaven. <laughs> I, uh, I had a single room and basically I spent an awful lot of time in that room by myself because for the previous nine months I'd been just surrounded by people and uh, it was fun. I ordered room service and you know, and I, there was another guy that I went with who was single and uh, he and I would go out during the day and then he'd take off at night and do what he wanted to do and I'd go back and just read, sleep, do whatever I wanted to do. It was very pleasant. All right, so after your three months on the Princeton and they needed pilots, what made you volunteer to, to stay? The living conditions. Because what was the other choice if you didn't volunteer to stay? Oh, I would have gone back into, back Chula. to Chulai, yeah, back to Kiha, yeah. So how much time was added uh, to your stay on the USS Princeton? Well, we switched ships. We then went on the Iwo Jima, the USS Iwo Jima, and it was three months on the Iwo Jima. And that's was where... Was that located in the same place? Yeah. But that's where I got lucky. In what way? The Iwo Jima developed um, contamination of the aviation fuel cells. There was some sort of a, a growth that was fouling the engines of the helicopters. So they had to take the ship to Japan. They offloaded us onto the USS Vancouver, which was a smaller ship, big enough to handle two aircraft at a time on the, on the flight deck. And, and then we stayed in the Philippines for 54 straight days waiting for the ship to come back from Japan. Because it had all your helicopters on it? Uh, it had, had some of them, but um, they just, they felt we would have been ineffective, I think, as a fighting force. You know, we were just too small and wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been effective enough. So we just stayed in the Philippines, which was... So what did you do every day? Oh, I played tennis, softball. We you had no military response. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. We we did some. We did a lot of training flights. Um, uh, simulated uh, troop insertions and that sort of thing while we were in the Philippines. But basically, it was playtime. Yeah, uh, we there was a uh, the Air Force had a a base at Baguio in the Philippines, which is up in the mountains about. 5,000 feet, and it was a, actually it was an R&R &R spot for the Air Force, but we could use it. So we would fly uh, plane loads of people up there, and they'd spend three or four days and then come back and take people to Manila. It was, uh, it was very nice, <laughs> very lucky. A big, big change from the first three months we were aboard the ship. After your 54 days in the Philippines, um did the Iwo Jima return and you returned to the ship? Yes. And then we went to um, <coughs> a, an operation in the Delta uh, called uh, Deck House 2. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll get you a uh, little clipping that I found on, you know, this day in history. Uh, I was so stunned to find it. Uh, it was an operation um, in the four core, so we were all the way down in the southern part of, of Vietnam, and we were to be a blocking force. We were to drop the troops off to be a blocking force from another group that was coming from another direction to squeeze the enemy in between. Uh, the enemy had disappeared apparently because it turned out to be it wasn't much of a mission. There were a lot of we did a lot of flying that that week, but. Uh, there was not much going on. It wasn't, it wasn't a hot zone at all when we went in. We took some small arms fire, but not much. When you would insert troops and you were flying from either the Princeton or the Iwo Jima, were the troops housed right on the boat with you, or did you have to go someplace to pick up these troops and fly them? Many of them were on the, on the ship with us. Um, in fact, I think all of them that we offloaded were on the Iwo Jima. There were some that went in by a track vehicle if it, we were 
landing on the on the beach. But, uh, so, because you had to go down from I Corps to Fourth Corps, did the Iwo Jima yes. go in? The, okay, so it sailed down to to the Fourth Corps, and that's where you disembarked from. Yep. What missions followed your Delta operation? Well, we went back to Chulai, and uh, I flew. For how long? Uh, just about two weeks. And then I was given a ground job, which is typically what they tried to do uh, for the last two to three months that you were going to be in country. They gave you a job that was not flying, gave you a ground job, unless you wanted to keep flying, which I didn't, wasn't too upset about getting a ground job. I went to work uh, at uh, Marine Air I don't know, M-A-A-S-3, uh, it was called, and their job was twofold. One was to coordinate um, needs in the field with the air wing. So uh, our group would get a call from a, squad or a, a platoon in the field saying they needed a medevac. And then it was our job to discern whether they needed uh, gunship support for the helicopters or whether they needed fixed wing support and and then we would coordinate that we would call the wing and say you know we need a we need an A4 to cover a mission going into such and such and and then they would put that together and, and get the medevac out the other mission which I was not involved in was coordinating um, radar bombing they would get information intelligence that at such and such coordinates there was a concentration of the enemy and at night they would fly over and bomb it uh, by using radar and and uh, that was the I, I never learned that part of it because I wasn't going to be there long enough when you had the ground job w were you located in a, an office right at Chulai initially and then I was sent for eight weeks to an outpost called uh, Nui Dang, N-U-I-D-A-N-G, which the Army later called uh, Buffalo. I found that out from a friend that was there later. Um, but it was a, um, just a mound of earth, right up, stood out like a uh, huge pimple on the on the coastline of of Vietnam between Quang Nai and, and Chu Lai and they had a battalion a battalion of Marines there and our group was there to coordinate their needs with the air wing. We had one of these geodesic domes, you know, would would house about uh, thousands of radio seen thousands, uh, ten or twenty radio radios and then the technicians to take care of the radios and an officer and an NCO to coordinate the, the needs of the field. And um, the, the beauty of it is it was air conditioned because it was uh, to keep the radios from overheating. So if that, was, that was the only good part of it because the rest of it, I lived in a, uh, under a flap, a tent, and, and a pile of sandbags that were probably well, chest high. That was my, my home in the field with a, with a cot and a sleeping bag. Yeah. And that I did. That was for eight weeks you lived like that? Uh, uh, six weeks. It was six weeks. Yeah, and I didn't take a shower for the whole six weeks. They didn't have, didn't? They didn't have shower facilities there. So we, you know, you just washed with your helmet, you'd pour it over your head. And, how many of you guys were stationed there? There were two of us that were there with uh, about a dozen enlisted men that were the radio technicians. And it was, it was probably one of the most interesting jobs I had while I was there. Um, you work 12 hours on and 12 hours off and um, seven days a week and when the day was over, it was over. You went back to your cot or stayed in the, in the dome and you could read in there because there were lights and things. 
and uh, it was just a time went fast. We were, I think there were there were I know there were a lot of VC operating in the area because a week after I left, they mortared the um, fuel field. They had this big fuel farm there for the helicopters that came in in these big plastic bags that held the aviation fuel when they landed a mortar on one of those. And it was uh, pretty spectacular. But while I was there, I only think I ever heard one incoming shell. That was a... Um, was it less stressful duty? Yes, much less. Now, on a lot of these missions, it sounds like you had to coordinate with other branches of the service, like the Air Force. Um, did, was it always Marines? You, if you needed air support, it was a, an another Marine? Yes. So you never worked with the Air Force or the Army? It was always other Marines? Um, I don't, th don't think I ever operated with anybody but the uh, Air Force. We did operate with the South Vietnamese very often. And the one operation we were on in, uh, I guess it was in the Delta, that, that operation, there were Australians involved too. And uh, we landed at a Michelin plantation, you know, Michelin tires. They had a rubber plantation there. And it was uh, quite a change from the usual Vietnam, Vietnam um, scenery because the trees were lined up in very neat rows, and uh, that's that was the headquarters for the Australian troops. But we just—it was brief, you know. You stop, you say hello, you have a drink, and you go on your way. It was—we didn't—we didn't coordinate that much with them. The Marine Corps provides its own fixed-wing support. At the time I was there, they had. F-8s, A-4s, and F-4s, um, and then the Huey gunships, and then for the big missions, like when they were going in and out of Quezon, they had C-130s uh, for carrying large amounts of... But those were uh, all marine aircraft. Yes. The one time, I guess I should tell you this, the one time we did, I did see the Air Force operate, it was really spectacular. We were at Dong Ha, which is in the, the northern part, very close to the de demilitarized zone. Um, it was in the evening, and, and every time an airplane would come in to land at Dong Ha, there would be one or two shots fired at it from, I don't know, a thousand yards off the end of the runway. So they called the Air Force, and the Air Force sent Puff, which was a an old piston C-47, which had been in the service in World War II, but which had miniguns loaded on one side of the airplane. So he made his approach as if he were coming into land, and a couple of tracer rounds went up at him, and then there was a, a sheet of red that went out of the, of the side of the airplane. It sounded like somebody tearing a bed sheet. And it went, it just was this for like four seconds, had just a sheet of red, and the red were the tracer bullets, and that was only one in every five. So that was the end of the problem we had that night. Yeah, it was, that was a very impressive sight. And then they just tootled on back wherever they had come from, you know. They, they called it Puff the Magic Dragon. What was it like when you worked with the South Vietnamese? Well, we called them chicken thieves. Uh, we would start on one side of a village where there were supposed to be some Viet Cong, and they were going to sweep through, and we were to pick them up at the other side of the village. And they'd go through, and every, almost every one of their soldiers came out with a chicken in his pack at the other end. And I remember distinctly one day at, at Quang Nai, we were waiting to pick up South Vietnamese for a troop insertion, and this one Vietnamese soldier wandered over. He said, no worry, Joe, no worry. No VC today, no VC. And he was right. There were no VC that day. I think there was a very leaky intelligence uh, operation in the South Vietnamese Army. They, they looked like a Boy Scout troop. They wore bandanas. Many of, them, many of the troops wore bandanas, and 
they, they were so small, uh, they just they did look like a Boy Scout troop. Some of them were ferocious fighters and, and did a good job, but for the most part, they didn't have the they didn't have the will that the North Vietnamese had, and they were they were not they weren't as they weren't nearly as effective as the North Vietnamese. Were there any casualties in your unit? Yes. Um, Uh, when I was at uh, when I was at Nui Dang, uh, a fellow named Mike Carley was was killed as he was flying into the into Nui Dang, and a guy named Jim Hippert was wounded. Um, a, a gunner in uh, in one of my helicopters was shot. Um, we were trying to pull out a uh, a reconnaissance team. When you went back to Chula, what did you do there? The ground job again? The ground job, yeah. I, that's that's where I left uh, country. So, and then did you leave country as an individual or with a squadron? Individual. Do you recall the date you left? Uh, I was thinking about that this morning. No, I have no idea. It was late April. April of 66? Seven. 67? Yeah. When and I, what was your trip home like? Uh, Interesting. It was World Airways um, with um, stewardesses. Um, in fact, uh, one of them scared half the guys on the plane to death because she uh, she was up in the front and all of a sudden she bolted part way back and leaned over three guys to look out the window. And it turns out. We, we didn't know what was going on, you know, we, I think everybody had this fear that as the plane was lifting off it was going to get shot up, but she was trying to see her boyfriend's squadron, he was an F-8 pilot, and she wanted to get a look at where his squadron was, but um, the plane was absolutely quiet as we took off. Um, you couldn't hear a thing, and then as we got in the air there was just this sort of uh, collective letting out a breath and then you know conversations started up and people some people were cheering and the one guy I felt most sorry for that day was um, the lowest ranked private who was bumped off the flight because somebody had to go home on a medical emergency and, and he had to get off and wait for the next day I felt so badly for the kid you know, he looked like he was about 17, and he just looked like he was going to cry. <clears throat> but we flew from from Da Nang to, I think we went all the way to Alaska, I refueled in Alaska, and then flew into Los Angeles. And that's the last time I was carded for a drink. I was with a friend named Barney Ross, and he and I went into the bar. We had time to wait before our various flights, and um, the waitress carded us. You know, we were two captains sitting there. I couldn't believe it. I said, "Oh, here you go." I was 27 at the time. I was 25 when I went to Vietnam, and 27 when I came home because I had two birthdays while I was there. Now. Were you, but you still had time to serve in the Marine Corps. Or they didn't discharge you immediately. Did no, they? I I went back to um, back to New River. Um, got there in June. And was um, discharged in in October, October first, so of sixty seven. Between June and October. Flew training flights with guys that were getting ready to go over and. That sort of thing. And you were discharged October 1st of 1967? Yes. What was that day like? Hallelujah. <laughs> that was great. Where did you go when you got discharged? Home to Pennsylvania. I 
I had a job with an insurance company lined up and uh, went to work. So you immediately went back in to the work field? I uh, took, I guess I did. We took a few days, but then I went, went back to work. Money was, money was short. <laughs> As I've told my kids many times, we were probably not more than two paychecks from homeless for a long time. You know, it's, it was a different world. Did you go back to school at all? I did. Um, I went to uh, Temple University. I was going to get an MBA. Uh, but then I changed jobs and uh, and then I took another, uh, several years later, I took another semester at the University of Bridgeport. But again, I just, uh, I had two kids at that point and it was too hectic. I had a kind of a pressure filled job and, and uh, I didn't, just didn't have the time to devote to it. Did you go to Temple on the GI Bill? Yes. And did you stay working in the insurance industry? Uh, accidentally, yeah. I, I started and left that job, went to work for a bank in Philadelphia. And then I went to Montgomery Ward in Albany, New York uh, as an accounting, uh, branch accounting officer. And then I took a job with uh, Hartford National Bank, and and then I went to work for Aetna after that, and or no, with Cigna, then with Aetna, and that's where I spent most of my career. I spent 17 years with Aetna in the real estate management field. How, how did you get to Connecticut? Uh, the job with Hartford National so was down in here. Westport, yeah. Did you stay in touch with any of your buddies from the service? Mm -hmm. Yes, still in touch with them. One is in Boston, one's in Wisconsin. Uh, yeah. Do you attend any reunions? I went to one. Um, it was it was fun to see some of the guys that I hadn't seen for a long time, but it was. Uh, I guess I wanted to put those days behind me. You know, I, that's what I tried to do after I got out. I just wanted to put it behind me, and I, I had no desire to relive it. And that's what they seemed to want to do at the reunion. Um, so that's the only one we went to. What did you think of the fellow officers? Um, <clears throat> fellow officers were great. It was a great, great group of guys. As particularly the uh, lieutenants and captains and some of the majors. I uh, had one um, commanding officer, J.D. McGall, who was made a full colonel while he was in charge of our squadron, who was the best leader I've ever operated Can under. Can you spell his name, his last name? M-C-G-O-U-G-H. I think. And why do you say he was the best officer you He led from the front. He was not a good helicopter pilot, and he admitted it. He, he had been a jet pilot that had transitioned over. And so what he did is he took the, the best pilot in the squadron, and he said, uh, McDonald, you're flying with me because I have to coordinate what's going to happen with the guys behind us. He said, you're going to do the flying. I'm going to do the watching. But as an example, the kind of guy he was, one night a, an order came in that there was a, a reconnaissance team that was surrounded, <clears throat> and they had to try and pull him out. And um, that's the kind of thing that he could very easily have said, pick two guys and send them while well, he went. And he came back and he had 57 holes in his, in his aircraft when he got back. He, just, he was just a natural leader and uh, a great guy. On the other hand, that operation in the Delta, the average pilot flew 
I don't know, 40 or 50 hours that week. Uh, the, the commanding officer, the executive officer, and the operations officer, the three senior men in the squadron, flew a grand total of three hours. I mean, they just stayed aboard the ship and didn't want to go in. So there was a mix. I mean, there were some guys that you couldn't stand. There were other guys that you're still friends with, you know, 40, 50 years later. So it's a... It's like anything else, but generally, it was a pretty high quality of, of person that was, was doing this. What did you think of the Marines beneath you? Oh, they were great guys. I, I, the, the enlisted guys that uh, fixed the helicopters and, and flew with us. I mean, the crew chief would fly with us all day and watch us do things that would damage his plane. I mean, the crew chief was assigned to one plane. And then he'd go back, we'd go to the club, or we'd go to our hooches and do whatever we were going to do. He had to fix the thing and get it ready to fly the next day. And, you know, they're the guys that just, they worked their tails off. And they were a good group. They really were. Did you join any veterans organizations after you got out of service? No. Bob, how would you say that your military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Uh, when I first got out, I thought the military was the most screwed up organization on the planet. But then I went to work for other big organizations and I realized it's just a typical big bureaucracy. Um, my feeling about war is that we better have a damn good reason for doing it. And the last couple of wars that we were involved in, I don't see that happening. Um, I think we should get out of Afghanistan and probably should not have gone into Iraq because I think it's put us behind the eight ball tremendously in the Middle East. Just gave the, the radical Islamists um, all the fodder they needed to do their recruiting. How did your Marine service and your military experiences affect your life? Uh, it matured me instantly. Um, and I think, um, you know, overall it was a good experience. Uh, as I've told so many people, I wouldn't want to repeat it, but it was probably the most difficult thing I, I ever did, but proved to myself that I could do it, I guess, was, would be the way to put it, and so it gave me confidence. Any regrets on choosing the Marine Corps? <laughs> it's funny. Um, I was at OCS suffering. I was in about the fourth week, and, and you were never comfortable at OCS, never. Uh, they, they kept you constantly behind. You were often sleep deprived because they had uh, guard duty at night where you'd get four hours sleep instead of seven. But I was there and I got a letter from my mother and she had included in it my orders to the Air Force OTS. And I just sort of sat and I thought, oh no, talk about a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> But um, no, I, I have no regrets really. I, it was as, it, it, it seemed unfair at times. For example, at the Nang, the Air Force pilots lived in air conditioned barracks and they were receiving an inadequate housing allowance. And across the base, the Marines were living in those big tents and getting $55 a month for separation allowance. So, but different mission. You know, the Air Force had one mission, we had another one, and so. But no, I'm, overall, I'm glad I did it. Is there anything else that you'd like to add or any other memorable experiences that I haven't asked you about? No, I'll probably think of some after you go, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bob, I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for your interview. Well, happy to do it. <laughs>